am Effie Barker. We are right here in downtown Los Angeles. When you say we're not going away with these issues, what are those issues? Good evening. Welcome to the special edition of Ognayan. I'm Effie Barker. I have a few minutes left. Um, this book, which I have been carrying for it, <laughs> I've been since I left Los Angeles and now I got a time reading it. <laughs> I enjoyed it. In the book, you had mentioned there that it became an impetus for you to write a book as a reminder of the brutal repression mm -hmm. under the Ferdinand Marcos dictatorship. But I say they are, as we talked earlier, they are changing the narratives now. A, how do you feel about that? And you said in the book that some former activists, um, you know, over the years, and things have changed and generation changed. And some of your comrades have, have been saying, were questioning whether it was all worth it. Mm -hmm. Do you feel that mm -hmm. it, was it all worth it? Yes, a big yes. Um, even if it was important to really stop the dictatorship. Okay. It was already, we've already, uh, people had lived 14 years of, well, Marcos, we live, we, we live uh, for about 20 years under Marcos, 14 of which, 14 years of which was a dictatorship. Um, it was at that point where there had to be a stop to what was going on. And it, and uh, that's why people united um, in order to do, to, to launch this very peaceful people power revolution. I just wanna make clear that it wasn't only doing that four, four, those, those four days of people power revolution. It was, it had been happening even years before that there was, so, you know, the movement was already alive and well um, in different places in the Philippines. Um, so it was a culmination of, you know, 14 years of people really being dissatisfied of, of, uh, of risking their lives to oppose the dictatorship. People, you know, people losing their, their livelihood, people whose families were destroyed because of the deaths, you know, people, the, the, the sons or daughters get killed by the military. Uh, but that, that was, that, that happened uh, because of that, you know, the combination of the different sectors in the Philippines coming together at that point in time. It was all worth it. And even if after that, we still had problems as a, as a country, I mean, we went through Strada, President Strada, who was impeached, right? He was, he was kicked out of office too for corruption. Uh, also Arroyo, who also was exposed for her corruption. I mean, we are a nation in progress, okay? We, the, the um, 1986 revolution was not meant to solve all of our problems because we have a lot of very um, deep problems in our, in our country. But it was a very, um, I must say it was a shining moment in Philippine history, right. okay? Filipinos showed the world what we could do to stop a dictator like Marcos. Okay. In fact, when the Arab Spring happened in Egypt, people were referring to the People Power Revolution in the Philippines as like one of the forerunners of such an uprising. Um, I mean, people were, you know, we were all over, all over the world. People were um, impressed by what Filipinos were able to do. Um, mm -hmm. And, um, <clears throat> so the, despite all the problems that happened after, you know, the ups and downs in the Philippines, I'm still hopeful, okay? I'm still hopeful that um, we will get to a point uh, where Filipinos really will be able to, to govern uh, and be concerned about the, the poorest of our population. Right now, there are about 26 million Filipinos who are under the poverty level, um, so which was exacerbated by the COVID epi uh, pandemic. Mm -hmm. So it's uh, it's as I said, it's we're a nation in progress, but I'm hopeful. I'm hopeful. What do you want the young 
Filipinos to understand about Ferdinand Marcos? Marcos Sr. did not declare martial law because of communism, okay? He declared martial law because his second term was ending. He wanted to perpetuate himself in power. He wanted to continue enriching himself, his family, his cronies, and his friends. Uh, and that was the main reason why he, those are the main reasons why he wanted to, to declare martial law. And he found, he found um, a convenient reason to say it's because of the communists. Uh, I'm and that's glad why that you pointed it out because mm -hmm. I've read also some comments online that they keep on saying martial law was bad, but um, what they have failed to explain is why did Mar Mar Marcos impose the martial law? The, po the point there is people were, were already, um, uh, they, have, they had gotten enough of the Marcos uh, rule because the economy was tanking, there's a lot of repression. There's a lot of, when you have that, when, you, when, you, when people are deprived of their rights and the economy uh, is, was forcing people to leave in the, mid, you know, in the hundreds of thousands for abroad uh, because, because they, couldn't, they couldn't feed their children anymore, surely there will be protests, right? Any country that mm -hmm. experiences that. So that became a convenient excuse to say the communists are doing this and therefore I have I have a very good reason to declare martial law. Personally, how do you feel about this, everything that's going on now um, with fighting with this new generation's narratives yeah. and with all the experiences that you and your comrades had? It, it's a lot of frustration, but, um, but understanding that this is the reality we have now, okay? People have grown up with social, social media, um, not enough, education in terms of uh, uh, the past, in terms of the, the dictatorship, for example, in the, I'm talking about the Philippines, but even here in terms of, for example, the history about slavery is now being <laughs> questioned um, that they should not be taught to kids, okay? Would you mm -hmm. say it's a combination of <laughs> a push from the government and the politicians' um, responsibility and a lack of historical sophistication from this young generation that contributes to where we are now. All of the above. Yes. If you look at it, um, for example, Ramos, uh, who succeeded uh, Cory Aquino, uh, was actually one of the, mm -hmm. the um, implementers of martial law. So why would he push for... Um, for a lot of education about martial law, right? So that, there was a lack of incentive for these people yeah. to, to really push for that um, educational material about martial law. Is so, it too late now to, to push this or you still have time? I, I always, that, that always gets me depressed when I say everything is too late. I think it wasn't too late for people revolution, people power revolution to come. Mm -hmm. It wasn't too late at all. Um, so you never can determine the, the kind of time it would take for the young people now to really, um, but we don't know. Some of, Effie, I have to, you know, some of these young people are very active volunteers in Lenny Robredo's campaign. My, my niece is a doctor mm -hmm. and she was born after a People Power Revolution in 1986. No, no, no knowledge about how it was, but she has become such a, such an active volunteer, you know, because, you know, as, as a doctor, she was, she was giving uh, vaccinations, you know, mm -hmm. for the Lenny Robredo campaign. I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't give up on the young people at, right away. Mm -hmm. I think, I think there is quite a lot of hope that uh, many of them you know, and, and when I look at the social uh, media coverage of the Lenny rallies, you know, that attract mm -hmm. hundreds of thousands of people, you see a lot of young people, okay, walking for miles in order to, um, to join the rally. So I, you know, I think we, we might be surprised yet. I would like to be surprised. Um, I have one last um, question for you. What would you want to tell them about the uh, uh, sincerely, I'd like to ask the young people to um, to really um, 
look at very reliable sources for information to see what really went on during martial law. To see what, bon what Marcus Jr.'s role had, has been in terms of protecting the families, uh, um, uh, you know, um, uh, stolen wealth. To look at what his uh, record is, what, what has he done in order, you know, during his years as a government, um, uh, as a member of Congress, what has he done? What did he do during the, the dictatorship in terms of um, um, uh, taking advantage of the, the wealth that the, the family has been able to uh, accumulate? Uh, look at how, um, what, what the kind of um, um, analysis he has about what happened in the past, whether it, it coincides with what all the documentation that has been that has come out about martial law, which you know to determine which is true and which is false. It's a very very difficult um, uh, place we are at now because truth has become, as I said, very inconvenient for a lot of people, and therefore it has become like a bad word. Okay, it has become labeled as fake news, so they have to really see for themselves and not just be taken by all these uh, cute TikToks and cute uh, Facebook uh, videos or cute YouTube videos. Um, because as a young person, they have to think of what their future is going to be, okay? If they vote in somebody for six years, six years is a lot of time for somebody to create either to do good for the country or to do damage to the country. So they really have to be very um, concerned about that. Um, it has not been easy because they did not get enough uh, information when they were growing up, but it's not too late. It's not too late. And, uh, and I cannot tell them now who to vote for. It's, it's their own choice, but I hope their choice will come from a deep understanding of who the candidates are and a deep understanding of what our history is. And that's my only hope is that, you know, they still, they are still the hope of the country and I hope they will not disappoint at all because they, this is a very, very crucial election, not only for their future, but the future of the whole country and even for overseas Filipinos because we are so attached to our country, to our families there. Uh, so we, we always show our deep concern about what's happening there. Thank you so much, Mila, for your time. I am grateful that we were able to do this. And I am happy that you have, I hope that it sheds some light to our viewers. And of course, this book has been vital for my interview today. <laughs> and is this still available? Uh, it's available in the Philippines. It's also available here. Uh, but in the Philippines, they can go to popular bookstore in Quezon City. Well, I want to thank you, Effie, because this is the kind of dialogue that really uh, we need at this particular time. Uh, as I said, this is a very, uh, very urgent time for all of us. Um, and I appreciate the questions that you ask that I, I think come from different people, because these are the sort, sort of questions that we need to respond to, because they're very valid questions. Mm -hmm. These are what they they hear or what they, they themselves think um, about what's happening in the Philippines. So I appreciate that. And, um, and I appreciate what you do because this is part of the whole looking at history in order to learn uh, and move forward. But we cannot move forward if we don't understand the history. Are you afraid of the result? Of the what? Of the, of the result of the election. <clears throat> I think it is another level of uh, increase, another stage in the impunity, in the, in the uh, perpetration of impunity, that people have been able to escape from any kind of prosecution, um, from committing a crime of tax evasion, uh, you know, and, and, and be able to be elected as, to be, you know, potentially be elected as president. That, that, that is 
what does what does it say to people? It's okay for you to to commit crimes and still, you know, go ahead and not get any kind of punishment for it? Or is it only people like the Marcuses or rich people who are who will be able to escape it? So it's really important um, to see what this would bring to, to Filipinos and also the whole country, okay? Uh, and as somebody who's, um, who lives in another country, it still worries me a lot. I have family there. I have a lot of friends there, as you do, Effie. Um, and I fear, I fear about the return of all the um, uh, policies of Marcus Jr.'s father, and if Sara Duterte wins the policies uh, of the father, you know, in terms of violence against uh, their own people, I, I fear for that. I fear for that because uh, um, Duterte has already uh, paved the way through the extrajudicial killings of uh, under his drug war, the bloody drug war. The fact that he he actually legitimized Marcos Senior by allowing the bur burial, his burial in the Hero Cemetery. Mm -hmm. So these are the people who are like, uh, who would potentially lead the country. And I really am fearful of, uh, but at the same time, I'm fearful, but I am hopeful that Filipinos will, will be able to um, defend our democracy, mm -hmm. that they will avoid or prevent another dictatorship from, from happening because of the lessons in the past. So I'm hopeful. So I'm 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 two ways. One is of course worried, but at the same time, I remain hopeful. And I think everyone should should try to do that hard as hard as it is. We have to keep hopeful. Right. Okay. Right. I would I would say good luck, but I would <laughs> I would I would rather say well God bless the Philippines. Yes. Uh, hopefully, uh, hopefully the odds will be in our favor. Yeah.